Well, you are welcome indeed. God bless you. I'm Pastor Swafford. Thank you so much for being a part of our Bible study tonight. Pray that everyone is doing well and that the Spirit of the Lord is moving in your life. All of your needs are being met and that the Lord is truly, truly being glorified in your life. So again, thank you so much for being a part of the study today. As you know, we're going through the Bible through the entire Bible, from Genesis all the way over to Revelation. And we've made our way now to 2 Kings, and we're just about to finish up 2 Kings. We're in the last two chapters uh, uh, tonight, so we'll be finishing up 2 Kings. So get your Bibles out, uh, your notepads for all of you uh, note takers, and we're going to be uh, diving into the Word of God. Just got one announcement I want to share uh, with you. And that is Men's Fellowship. Men, our fellowship is coming up. Uh, actually, it is this Saturday, this coming Saturday. And you'll see the information up there on the screen as to uh, uh, how to access the information. So uh, uh, looking forward to seeing all of you all there. Amen. Well, since that's it, we can just get off and rolling in the Word of God. So grab your Bibles. We're going to pray and uh, see what thus says the Lord. Bow with me, please. Our Father and our God, the hour has come that your word should go forth in power and uh, in might. And Father, I am the first one to recognize just who the teacher really is. And that is your precious Holy Spirit. So Holy Spirit, teach us. Open up our hearts and our minds that we might receive the engrafted word of God, which is able to save us, which is able to change us, which is able to bring us out of darkness and into your marvelous light. For this, Lord, we say thank you. Father, we thank you for the authority that you've given us in your word. We exercise that authority right now by binding every devil, every demon, every foul, every hindering spirit. We declare this place Bethel, the house of God. And we also declare it Bethlehem, the house of bread. So we thank you that there is bread in your house tonight that your children might eat in the name of Jesus Christ. Speak now to our hearts, O God. We listen in Jesus' name. Amen and uh, amen again. Well, we're in 2 Kings, 2 Kings, and we're going to be uh, going into chapter number 24, looking at chapters 24 and 25 uh, tonight. And uh, where we left off, we saw, uh, uh, we were really, we spent a lot of time looking at King Josiah. And uh, uh, if you recall, King Josiah was uh, probably the last righteous king uh, that Judah had. He was a good king. 
He did good in the sight of the Lord. He did what was right in the sight of the Lord. The scripture says that he followed in the ways of his father, David. Uh, 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 So he was uh, one of the few kings in our study that has been compared uh, to David. And we see all of the things that Josiah did. uh, And it just so happened that Josiah had sent one of his servants to the high priest to make sure that some workers were being compensated. And while he was there, they found the word of God. They found the Bible, the law, the law of Moses, which had been lost, which had been just hidden away and uh, uh, not even looked at, not even considered. And once uh, they saw that, they uh, took it to Josiah. They read it, Josiah tore his clothes, and he began to realize what was going on and the reason that the wrath of God had really come upon the people was uh, because the people had disobeyed the word of God. They were not following in the ways of God, in the commandments of God. And so Josiah just had a heart for the Lord. He went and he inquired of the prophets, and you remember the prophetess, Uh, uh, The prophetess came and she told uh, or sent word to Josiah, rather, that what was happening to uh, Judah was because they had disobeyed the word of God. They had come away from the word of God and all of the evil that their fathers had done. And as we looked at this, we began to realize that this is more than just a story in the Old Testament of some things that happened to some people back in the day. Uh, The Old Testament gives us natural examples of spiritual things, and we can really make some comparisons as to things that are happening in our lives, in our land, in our country, in the world right now. The hand of God is moving. Judgment is really taking place. Judgment is really taking place with uh, Judah. And as I said in our last teaching, Israel, northern kingdom, had already fallen. They had already fallen to the Assyrians. And now we are looking strictly at Judah, southern kingdom. They are now falling. They are about to be taken away into captivity. And also keep this in mind. I don't know if I said this uh, uh, last Wednesday or not, but at this time, Jeremiah the prophet. We all know Jeremiah. He's a prophet uh, at this time. And uh, also Ezekiel prophesies too at, at this time. These are prophets who are active in this day. Now, and then we saw on uh, uh, last week, we saw the death of Josiah. And that was sad because Josiah died because he meddled into something. He got involved in something that he shouldn't have been involved in. And so after he died, his son, Jeho- uh, how's it? Jehoahaz, he was uh, the, the, then the king, and his reign was very short, and he died. And then his son, Jehoiakim, became king, king of uh, Judah. And uh, that is where we're going to pick it up. So Uh, Let's go to chapter 24, of course, and uh, let's look at verse number one. In his days, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up, and Jehoiakim became his vassal for three years. Then he turned and rebelled against him. So here comes King Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. He comes up, and it says that Jehoiakim, he is the one who was reigning in Judah. Jehoiakim became his uh, vassal. In other words, uh, uh, Jehoiakim, he was he was weak. The king of Babylon just kind of strong-armed him, kind of made him do the things that he wanted him to do. And uh, you can really see the nation of uh, Judah, you can see them really going down. They're just getting weak and weaker and uh, uh, weaker. And after a period of time, Jehoiakim, 
rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar. I mean, by this time, Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon, they are powerful. They are the most powerful nation on the earth at this time. They were so powerful that they had even conquered the Assyrians who had conquered the northern kingdom. So those uh, are the people of God who were in the northern kingdom under the captivity of the Assyrians are now under the captivity of the Babylonians. But now here in verse number one, Jehoiakim, after three years, he decides that he's going to rebel against uh, 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 Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. But look at this. I find this so interesting in verse 2. And the Lord sent against him, the Lord, the Lord sent against him raiding bands of Chaldeans, bands of Syrians, bands of Moabites, and bands of, of the people of Ammon. He sent them against Judah to destroy it. It said God did that. It wasn't the devil. It was God who did that. And that just goes to show you, you get off into sin. You get off into things that don't glorify God. You, you just get out there. God has a way. He has a way of kind of guiding folks and kind of leading them to where he wants them to be. But it was God who sent these people after him, these bands, these raiding bands. And note something else. If you go way back when the nation of Israel was really going into the land, when they were being led by Joshua, there were people in the land. Remember, God had given them the land. However, there were people still living in the land, but God told them to take the land. He said that there were people in the land and that he would be with them and that they were to take this land. They were to destroy the people in this, these lands. These are the same people. They didn't do it. They didn't do it. They, they did not overcome all of the folks that were in the land. And now look at where they are. So it was the Lord that sent these people. It was the Lord that sent their enemies against them to destroy them. And it says, according to the word of the Lord, which he had spoken by his servants, the prophets. Let me read on. Verse three. Surely at the commandment of the Lord, this came upon Judah to remove them from his sight because of the sins of Manasseh, according to all that he had done. He said that God wanted to remove them from his sight and remove them from his sight because of the sins of Manasseh. Remember, we talked about him a little bit on last week and how wicked, how evil he was, that he did more to provoke the wrath of God than any other king. I mean, here is a guy that had all of these uh, 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 high places, a, a, a guy that had uh, these uh, uh, places where they worship Baal, and the Ashtaroth, he built altars to these things. They had their children to pass through the fire. Manasseh was the one that was responsible for that. He brought a lot of this stuff up on the nation of Israel. And it's something interesting as a point of study when you look at Manasseh. Uh, it's interesting when you find out who his father was. Do you remember a man, and uh, we looked at him not too long ago. His name was Hezekiah. Hezekiah. It was Hezekiah that God sent the prophet Isaiah and told him, hey, get your house in order for you're going to die. And then what did uh, 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 Hezekiah do? Hezekiah turned his face to the wall. He began to cry out unto the Lord. He began to pray God told Isaiah to go back and tell him, all right, all right, you're crying out to me. I'm going to give you 15 more years. And you know what? In that 15-year period, Hezekiah had a son. And guess who that son was? Manasseh. Maybe if Hezekiah had just gone on home to be with the Lord, 
a lot of things could have been avoided. But I, I found that so interesting to find that uh, uh, Manasseh was uh, uh, the son of uh, Hezekiah. And he did all of this evil, shedding all of this uh, uh, innocent blood, as you see in verse 4. And also because of the innocent blood that he had shed. For he had filled Jerusalem with the innocent blood, uh, which the Lord would not pardon. The Lord was not going to look away from that. The Lord was not going to turn away from that and just ignore that. The Lord will deal with sin. And that's something that we must understand that no one sins and get away with it. The scripture says that the wages of sin is uh, death. Let me read on. Look at verse 5. Now the rest of the acts of Jehoiakim and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah? So Jehoiakim rested with his fathers. Then Jehoiachin, uh, then Jehoiachin, uh, let's see here. Where is it? I lost my place. So, so Jehoiakim rested with his fathers. Then Jehoiachin, his son, reigned in his place. So now that Jehoiakim has died, his son Jehoiachin now reigns in his place. Verse 7, and the king of Egypt did not come out of his land anymore, for the king of Babylon had taken all that belonged to the king of Egypt from the brooks of Egypt to the river Euphrates. Now, you remember there was a period when uh, 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 the kings of Egypt, when they really had control of Judah and really calling the shots and collecting tribute from the people there in Judah. But now it says that the kings of Egypt did not come out of the land anymore. And they didn't come out of the land anymore because Babylon had become so powerful that they were it. They were the most powerful nation at that time. So even Egypt, they just like, they backed off. They never really came out of the land to come up against Judah. Now, uh, let me read on verse number eight. Jehoiachin was 18 years old when he became king and he reigned in Jerusalem three months. His mother's name was Nehushta, the daughter of El Nathan of Jerusalem. And here it goes, verse 9. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord according to all that his fathers had done. You would think, at least in, in my mind, you would think with all that had gone down here, with all that they had seen, with all of the, the hardship, all of the captivity, all of the death, all of the pain and suffering that somebody would have said, hold on here, what's going on? And you, it would, you would think it would cause you to take a look and look at your life and maybe I need to change. But it says here, he did evil in the sight of the Lord. Verse 10, at that time, the servants of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up against Jerusalem, and the city was besieged. Now, you're going to see on several occasions, and I think it's primarily three different occasions where the Babylonians come up against Jerusalem to besiege it. They would come on uh, uh, three different occasions, and uh, uh, this is one of them, them right here. They're coming up against this nation, this powerful nation, Babylon, coming up against uh, Jerusalem. And uh, let me read on a little bit more. Uh, look at verse 11. And Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came against the city as his servants were besieging it. Now, uh, uh, the king himself came as they were besieging uh, 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 that city. The king himself came there. Uh, then Jehoiachin, king of Judah, his mother, his servants, his princes, his officers went out to the king of Babylon and the king of Babylon in the eighth year of his reign took him prisoner. So here comes the Babylonian. The Babylonian army came up to besiege Jerusalem and not just the army, King Nebuchadnezzar came up with them. 
I mean, here he is, the king is out here. And then uh, the king of Judah at that time, Jehoiachin, he comes out. He comes out with his wife, his mother, his officers and, and people, and they are just taken into captivity. They are taken into captivity without a fight, without a struggle. They are led away into captivity by the king himself. Let me read on a little bit more. Look at verse 13. And he carried out from there all the treasuries of the house of the Lord and the treasuries of the king's house. And he cut in pieces all the articles of gold which Solomon, king of Israel, had made in the temple of the Lord, as the Lord had said. I mean, not only is he taking the king and all of the king's family, they're taking the treasuries out of the house of the Lord, out of the king's house. They're just taking the, everything. Verse 14, also, he carried into captivity all Jerusalem. Listen, many of them. Now, you're going to see where this is at one time where they're coming and they're taking captives uh, 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 out of Jerusalem. It would be at this time when they're taking the best. They're taking the brightest. It would be at this time where people like Daniel, uh, Mishael, Ezariah, Hananiah, they were taken also at this time. These young men, they were they were the best. They were people of nobility, and the king of Babylon wanted them. Just marched in, and uh, he took them. It says, all the captains and all the mighty men of valor, 10,000 captives, and all the craftsmen and smiths, none remain, it, now get, get this, none remain except the poorest people of the land. They're taking the best. They're taking the brightest, and they left the poor people. Maybe there's something to be said about being poor. They didn't go into captivity. The poorest of the people. And one of the reasons when you study, you'll find out that uh, uh, they left the poor people because the poor people would be there and they would work the land so that the land would not be totally overtaken. But they would leave the poor people. And uh, verse 15, and he carried Jehoiakim captive to Babylon, the king's mother the king's wives, his officers in the mighty of the land, he carried into captivity from Jerusalem to Babylon. All who were skilled, all who had any gifts or talents, he took them into Babylon. Let's look at verse 17. Then the king of Babylon made Mathaniah Jehoiachin's uncle. He made Jehoiachin's uncle king of in his place and changed his name to Zedekiah. Now, after he had taken Jehoiachin into captivity, and we're talking about the king of Babylon, he made Jehoiachin's uncle the king of Judah. And note this, that he changed his name. And kings would do that in, a, uh, in that day. And by doing that, that would be saying, you belong to me. You are, you are controlled by me. You are not your own. You do what I say you do. I have complete rule, complete authority over you. And that is what is happening here. And so you can see now that uh, 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 the Babylonian empire now controls uh, Judah. So he put Jehoiachin's uncle uh, uh, in charge and changed his name to Zedekiah. Now, let me read on. Look at verse 18. Zedekiah was 21 years old when he became king, and he reigned 11 years in uh, uh, Jerusalem. His mother's name was Hamucho, uh, the daughter of Jeremiah of Libni. And get this, he also did evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that Jehoiakim had done. They still are doing evil in the sight of of, uh, of the Lord. Uh, verse 20, for because of the anger of the Lord, this happened in Jerusalem and Judah, that he finally cast them out from his presence. Then Zedekiah rebelled against the king of Babylon. That's probably a mistake. 
Here he decides now that he's going to, to rebel. Let's move into chapter number 25, verse 1. Now it came to pass in the ninth year of his reign, in the tenth month, on the tenth day of the month. The Bible is specific, isn't it? Gives you the day, the year, the month, the exact day that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all his army came against Jerusalem. Now, remember I said he, he came on uh, several different occasions. This is another time. They've already come in. They've taken the best. They've taken the brightest. They've taken the kings, the king's mother, the king's wives, a uh, 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 royalty, noblemen, and all of these folks. They've taken them captivity. And now here they are. They're coming back against Jerusalem, encamped against it, and they built a siege wall against it all around the city. Now, now they've got them surrounded. They're all hemmed in. Uh, it says, so the city was besieged until the 11th year of King Zedekiah. Now, some things are happening while they're uh, under siege. It says, by the ninth day of the fourth month, the famine had become so severe in the city that there was no food for the people of uh, the land. So you can see what has happened here. There uh, now, uh, uh, since all of the people uh, have been taken into captivity, except these few who are remaining here. You know, they're weak. There's hardly no food. There is a famine. People are suffering. The Babylonians have surrounded uh, 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 Jerusalem, if you will. And uh, uh, the scripture says, in the famine is in uh, the land. Uh, let me just read a little bit more here. For the city wall was broken through, and all of the men of war fled by night. There was a wall. The walls had been broken down, and those who were remaining, many of the soldiers, men of war, they would slip out by night. Everybody's trying to get out of here, trying to uh, uh, avoid capture by the Babylonians, which uh, uh, they have very little choice here because, uh, because of sin, really. This whole thing, they are going into captivity because of sin. Uh, let's look at verse 6. So they took the king and brought him up to the king of Babylon at Rebli, and they pronounced judgment on him. Here they get the king. They've already besieged the place. And they take the king of Judah, they take him into captivity. Now, note what they did here in verse 7. Then they killed the sons of uh, Zedekiah before his eyes. Now, they capture the king. They got the king's sons. And they killed the king's sons right before Zedekiah's eyes. Zedekiah has to watch the death of his own sons. And note this, uh, they killed the king's sons of Zedekiah before his eyes, put out the eyes of Zedekiah, bound him with bronze fetters, and took him uh, to Babylon. Note what they did. They killed his sons. They put his own eyes out. They bound him, and then they, what? took him to Babylon. Here he is going into Babylon, going into captivity. The death of his sons and his eyes have been uh, put out. This is what happened to this man. And it says here, and let me look at uh, verse number eight. And in the fifth month, on the seventh day of the month, which was the 19th year of King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, a servant of the king of Babylon, came up to Jerusalem. Now, after these people had been taken into captivity, and then here comes this guy, uh, 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 Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, and it's like he came up to really just finish things off, if you will. He's going to just do the final destroying, the burning and you're going to see all of the things that he did. Let me, let's just read some of it. Look at verse number nine. He burned the house of the Lord and uh, the king's house. 
all the houses of Jerusalem, that is, all the houses of the great, he burned with fire. Here is this guy. Now, remember, they've already taken the best, the brightest, and all of these people into captivity, only left the poor, and uh, uh, now they are just destroying the city. They are burning houses, burning them to the ground. And if you can recall the, the day, the day of the former glory of Jerusalem, and you remember when Solomon had built the temple and all of these things that Solomon had put in, in the temple, how glorious it was with all of this stuff, being overlaid with gold, and God was truly, truly being glorified. And then you see what is happening now in this same place. This was the place where the ark of the temple rested, the place where God's name was, and they were to lift up the name of the Lord how the mighty have fallen. So he's burning all of this stuff, all of the houses. Uh, look at verse 10. And all the army of the Chaldeans who were with uh, the captain of the guards, he broke down the walls of Jerusalem all around. Jerusalem is being destroyed, totally destroyed. Then Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the guard, carried away captives the rest of the people uh, 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 who remained in the city and the defactors who had deserted to the king of Babylon with the rest of the multitude. A lot of these people, they tried to escape by night. Some of them just voluntarily went and just gave themselves up to uh, uh, the Babylonians. Uh, verse 12, but the captain of the guard left some of the poor of the land as vineyard, vine dressers, and farmers. Notice they would leave the poor, and the poor would just keep the land. They were vine dressers. They were farmers. And then it starts to talk about all of the stuff that was destroyed. And it's so interesting because it brings to mind all of these things that Solomon had built in the temple. And you'll remember it as we read some of it. The bronze pillars that were uh, uh, in the house of the Lord. You remember those big bronze pillars and how they were decorated, how the sun would come up in the east and shine on these bronze pillars. These things, all of these things are being uh, destroyed. The carts, you remember the carts that they would use to carry the various things in the temples or the altars for the sacrifices. The bronze sea, that were in the house of the Lord, the Chaldeans broke in pieces and carried their bronze to Babylon. They're destroying all of this stuff. Verse 14, they also took away the pots, the shovels, the trimmers, the spoons, and all the bronze utensils uh, uh, with which the priests ministered, the fire pans. You remember all of that stuff? It says, in the captains of the guards, took these things away. The two pillars, one C in the cart, which Solomon had made uh, uh, for the house of the Lord. All of this stuff being destroyed, all of it being taken away. Why? Because of uh, sin. And as you, you can read that on through there, uh, drop down to verse number 21. Then the king of Babylon struck them and put them to death. And it's talking about the captains of the guards there who were left, uh, those who hadn't run off or had been taken captive. So the king of Babylon struck them, put them to death at uh, Reblah in the land of uh, Hamah. Thus Judah was carried away captive from its own land. Now, how sad is that? Here is Judah, God's people, carried away captive taken out of their own land. This was the land that God gave them. God gave them that land. Yeah, uh, you remember when we were studying the, the divisions of the land and they were going in there with, with Joshua and they were dividing up the land. This was their land, but now they've lost it. And it just goes to show you what sin does. You know, you can suffer great loss because of sin. And many people, many people this day, suffering great loss because of uh, sin. 
here they are, God's people being taken away into captivity. Now, now look at this. Look at verse number 22. Then he made Jedaliah, the son of uh, Achim, the son of Shephan, governor over the people who remained in the land of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had left. It has fallen so much. It is so small. We're, not, we're no longer talking about a king. Now there's somebody there by the name of Jedaliah. He's now a governor. You see how they've fallen? See how they've come down? And, uh, uh, and then they try to start a, a somewhat of a rebellion. Let me read just a little bit. Now when all the captains of the armies, they and their men heard uh, that the king of Babylon had made Jedaliah governor, they came to uh, uh, Jedaliah at Mizpah, Ishmael, the son of uh, Nathaniah, Jonathan, the son of uh, Carmariah, and they list all of these other people, and they try to get together. They try to form something, and Jedediah, Jedediah took an oath before them and their men and said to them, do not be afraid of the servants of the Chaldeans. Dwell in the land and serve the king of Babylon. In other words, you know, th this is it. This, this is what we have now. This is going to be how it is now. They're, they're done for. They are over. Uh, drop. There's something interesting down here in the last part of this. In verse number 27, now it came to pass in the 37th year of the captivity of Jehoiachin. You remember him, taken captive. He's the one that went out and met the king of Babylon, Jehoiachin king of Judah, in the 12th month, on the 27th day of the month, that evil Murdoch, now what a name, evil Murdoch, king of Babylon, in the year that he began to reign, released Jehoiakim, king of uh, Judah, from prison. So Jehoiakim was taken captive into Babylon, but this king, Evil Murdoch, now you would think the name Evil Murdoch, he ain't getting anything good out of somebody with the name Evil Murdoch. But Evil Murdoch released, had a, a, a Jehoiachin released from prison. He let him out of the prison there in Babylon. He's still in Babylon, but he let him out of the prison. And note this in verse number 28. He spoke kindly to him and gave him a more prominent seat than those of the kings who were with him in Babylon. Babylon, there, were, there would have been several kings that had been taken into captivity by the Babylonians. And uh, they, they would treat them well. Here you can see where they're giving him a prominent seat there. And note this in verse number 29. So Jehoiachin changed from his prison garments and he ate bread regularly before the king all the days of his life. And as for his provisions, there was a regular ration given him by the king, a portion for each day, all the days of his life. This king, evil Murdoch, had mercy. He had mercy on Jehoiachin, who was in prison in Babylon, and he had him released. And when he was released, he was given a change of clothes, a change in his garments. He changed from his prison attire, took him out of prison, gave him a prominent seat, gave him a place to eat, regular portions of food. And when you look at that, it almost sounds like the mercy that the Lord had on us. When the Lord comes into our lives, when the Lord comes to us and we were in the prison of sin, just like all of us, we once were, we were born in sin. We were born in this prison, if you will, this prison of sin, but the Lord had mercy on us. He released us. He brought us out when we accepted him as our personal Lord and Savior. He brought us out of this prison. There was a change of garments. 
over in the New Testament, it talks about taking off the old and putting on the new. It talks about the fact that the Lord is our source. He is our supply, that he would meet our every need. You get a real picture here of the grace and the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that comes upon us and how he brings us out. And we should take advantage of the fact that he brought us out. Take advantage of the fact that salvation has been brought to us. Grace and mercy has come upon us because of a relationship with the Lord. But we have to remember here what we've seen through all of this, through 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 the uh, 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 from where we started out in Genesis, really, all the way over to where we are. We saw the promises of God. We saw God deliver a people, God taking care of a people. We saw him take a people through the wilderness, provided for them when they had nothing. We saw water come from a rock. We saw manna fall out of heaven. The scripture says that when they were obedient to the word of the Lord, their shoes did not even wear out. And the promises of God, the promise that God uh, uh, gave to Abraham, that he would have these children and they would occupy this land. And they did just that. However, because of sin, because of unrighteousness, they lost everything that the Lord had given them. And that same thing can happen to us. We can lose it all because of sin. But you know what? The good part about that, he sh- the word shows us how to get it back. Oh, that's the beauty of 1 John 1, 9, that if we would confess with our mouth, that the, if we would confess our sins, that he is faithful and that he is just to forgive us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So if you look at your life and you say to yourself, you know, I've blown it. I've messed up. I've taken the wrong course. I've made some bad decisions. And now I find myself in a place where I don't want to be. I can call upon the name of the Lord. I can confess my sins. And the Lord will raise me up. He'll pick me up. He'll dust me off. He'll make sure that I am fruitful and that I am doing what uh, uh, he would desire me to do. And that's really the overall picture of this, because we don't want to see ourselves going into captivity. We don't want to see ourselves trapped in Babylon as God's people found themselves. Amen. That concludes 2 Kings and uh, uh, we'll start moving on into uh, uh, First Chronicles in our next study. Amen. Bow with me for a word of prayer. Father, we thank you. We praise you. We give you glory and honor. Thank you for this time in your word. We pray, O oh Lord, that your word has been seed, seed sown on good ground, and that it will produce fruit in Jesus' name. And then there may be those of you under the sound of my voice and you've never asked Jesus to be your personal Lord and Savior. The Bible says that he who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So wherever you are, whoever you are, call upon the name of Jesus. Just simply say, Jesus, come into my heart. I believe that you're the son of God. I believe that you died on a cross for me and for my sins, and I accept you as my personal Lord and Savior. If you say that prayer, if you confess it, if you believe it in your heart, then you're a child of God, and I welcome you to the body of Christ. Amen. Well, God bless you, and thank you again for uh, being a part of our Bible study tonight. I thank God for you, pray for you daily, and uh, hey, we'll see you next time. Take care, everybody. Thank you for joining today's broadcast. Please visit us on our website, 
at rolcm.org.